conversation is a long time coming from the work that you've been doing. The journey of this book doesn't start when you started writing this book. The journey of this book for you became something that you got focused on a long, long time ago. Yeah, true. And I wanted to focus on one point to give people this context. You know, you're seen as someone who's superhuman. You're able to do incredible things on stage, off stage. You have a phenomenal physical, mental, psychological presence. You have a beautiful spiritual presence. But at the same time, you talk about in this book being 31 years old and finding out about this brain tumor. Yes. I want to hear about what that feels like when you think you're doing everything right for your health. Yeah. And it hasn't been a point of concern. And all of a sudden, you get this news. How does that feel? Well, it was scary, obviously. Actually, it started a little sooner than that. When I was really young, I, I grew up really rapidly. I worked 20 hour days and then I was also blessed. And I got to work with some very important people and I got great results and they told other people. So by the time I was 19, just almost 20, I had become quite successful in external terms, at least in the world. And some part of me was, you know, the kind of the, the mechanism in the back of our head, that two million year old brain, right? The fight or flight mechanism. I didn't know how to manage that so well. And part of my brain was like, well, maybe you have all this happening so quick because you're going to die young. And I literally became obsessed with not just getting hit by a truck or something. It was cancer. I was going to wilt away. I don't know where it came from. And I knew better intellectually, but it was there. And then um, the first time I entered my life was before 31. I entered my life through someone else, my girlfriend. And she came home crying uncontrollably. And Jay, I mean, she was like, like, what is it? What is it? My mom, my mom, and my mom has cancer. And then even worse, they gave her nine weeks to live. They just sent her home. And I think if it would have been me, I think my fear would have overcome me. But you know, most people will do more for people they love, whether it be their kids or their family or someone else than they'll ever do for themselves. And so it's like, I kicked into gear. That's what I do. It's like, okay, if there's a problem, there's a solution. I said, look, there's thousands of people that had stage four cancer and they're alive today. We're gonna find out what they do. We're gonna do the same thing. She's not gonna die. And then I just read every book I could on cancer. And I came across this one book called um, One Answer to Cancer. It's not the book I recommend today because there's so many better ones today, but it was written by this dentist who had pancreatic cancer which is the most vicious cancer of all. He was given six weeks to live, and this is 12 years later, and he's alive. And so he laid out what he did to cleanse his body, which sounded radical in those days, pancreatic enzymes. So I went to this woman, her name was Jenny, she was in her 40s. And I said, Jenny, you know, I know you don't want to die. I said, but just going home and do nothing. Why don't you read this book? This guy was in worse shape than you, and see if you wanted to apply this. And she read it, and she got inspired. And I gave her As a Man Think It to kind of work on her head a little bit. Anyway, long story short, within about Three weeks, you could, she had a, a tumor that was protruding in her shoulder and the one in her feminine organs. And you couldn't see anything three weeks later on her shoulder. And at uh, the period of, I think, about nine weeks when she was supposed to die, and she looked good, she had great energy, and like, literally looked transformed. The doctor finally said, this is crazy. Like, let's do exploratory surgery. So they went in, in her body. All they could find left of the cancer was something the size of my pinky's fingernail. And so the doctor said, this is a miracle. She said, it is a miracle, but let me tell you what I did. And he was like, no, 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 this is spontaneous remission. I don't want to hear what you did. What you did doesn't matter. But she's in her mid eighties today. She's still alive. And that shifted me from victimhood, like, oh my God, cancer could strike me down to believing I'll be great. So all the more shocking, now I'm a total biohacker. I'm a health nut. I've got to get on stage and do, you know, 12, 13 hours with 20,000 people. And I got to do it three or four days in a row. And I make these huge demands. But I also have this incredibly intense regimen of taking care of myself. And then I went, I'm a helicopter pilot. So I went to go get my license renewed. You have to do a physical. And I come back and I keep getting these messages from the doctor saying, my assistant saying, the doctor says he's got to talk to you. And I was like, I'm leaving for the south of France to do an event. Tell him to just send the report. And I got home this one night and taped to my, bat, my master bathroom, bedroom door was a note from my assistant saying, you've got to call the doctor. He says it's an emergency. So what do you do? What do you feel like? Well, all my old fears just started flashing back. It's like, oh my God, I mean, I treat my body so great. How could I have cancer? But I do fly all the time. That's radiation. You know, your head goes crazy. At least mine did. Yeah. Um, but Self-diagnosis. But at that time, I had also found a center in my life. And so I found my center. It's like, okay, courageous person, you know, you know, coward dies a thousand deaths, courageous person once. Let me deal with it if it needs to be dealt with in the morning. I woke up, called, and the doc says to me, you have a tumor tumor in your brain. It's like, what are you talking about? I came to you, I'm totally healthy. I'm healthy as a horse. And he said, no, no, no. He said, you have an enormous amount of growth hormones. So 
I did some tests. I said, you know, how'd you notice the growth hormone? My hands are bigger than your head. I wear a size 16 shoe. I was 5'1", now I'm 6'7". I, you know, I grew 10 inches in a year. And he goes, no, don't be funny. He goes, you need to hear me. This is serious. And he said, you really need to do this. And we'll do what? You got to come in for surgery. I was like, wait a second. I said, you're telling me you're going to cut me open? I said, what's the prognosis? He said, well, obviously you can die. The only time you do surgery that's this complex. But he said, it's your pituitary gland. And he said, he said the, you know, you're probably not going to have the same kind of energy anymore because it'll change your biochemistry. And I was like, well, I think I should get a second opinion. Who, who would you recommend? And he did, he did not have a good bedside manner. And I didn't have a good side, bedside <laughs> manner either. I was a young punk kid. It was like, well, how do you tell me I'm going to have to have the surgery? So I kind of blew it off since he was such a jerk about it. It's like, I'll take care of it when I get home. And I flew to south of France and I did this seminar. But then, you know, the mind, you know, the mind starts going like, what if he's right? What if it's this? So I went and did the scan and I saw the look on the guy's face when I came out from the MRI. And sure enough, I had a tumor there. It was interesting though, Jay, it was a big tumor. That's why I grew 10 inches in a year. And, but it infarct, which means it swallowed a portion of itself up. It was still there. And he said, we still need to do the surgery. So I went and did, I said, okay, he's a surgeon. Let me go to somebody who's more biochemically driven. So I went to this man in Boston, uh, a neurobiologist, and he was really completely different. He was super warm. And he said, look, he goes, I would never do the surgery. It's way too risky. There's a place in Switzerland you can go to, and you can take an injection once every six months. And you'll never have to worry about it. Because what they worry about is I have gigantism, it's called. It makes your arteries get really big, and then you have a heart attack. I said, well, Doc, you just said my arteries are perfect. And this happened 12 years ago. I said, why would I do anything? He goes, well, we just want to be certain. I said, well, what if, that, you know, what if I'm not certain the drugs are not going to have side effects, you know? Yeah. He goes, well, it will really make you tired all the time. I was like, tired all the time? Said, that's that's <laughs> the opposite of my whole life. I said, I'm, energy is the source of everything for me. And he's like, oh, you're afraid. You're like Samson. You're afraid you want to cut your hair. And I said, you're damn right I am, you know? But he was so cool. I, I said, but you know, the surgeon wants to cut me. He goes, yeah, the baker wants to bake. You know, he's the butcher wants to butcher. The surgeon wants to cut and I want to drug you. He's really cool. And I said, what if I did nothing? He goes, but I measured it. Like, I'm not stupid. I go measure it once a year or something. He goes, well, you could do that. And thank God I did, Jay, because six months later, the FDA, I was having to go to Switzerland because it wasn't available in the US, and the FDA never allowed it in because they found it created cancer. So I missed a bullet. I went to five other docs, so six in total, seven in total, and the last doc told me what I wanted to hear, <laughs> which was, Tony, you have a huge amount of growth hormone. But he goes, you literally do, you know, I burn 11,300 calories in one day on stage, to give you an idea. I mean, this group followed me for three years, that followed Olympic athletes and Tom Brady and people like that. And so they've measured everything in my body. And he goes, you're doing two and a half marathons, basically, in calorie burn in a day, and you're doing four days in a row like that. He goes, your ability to recover is insane. He said, two or three days, you've recovered. He goes, that's, that's coming from that growth hormone, I believe. And he said, so I know bodybuilders that are spending 1,200 bucks you know, a month to have what you're getting for free. <laughs> so that was when I was 31. I'm 62. I've never had a problem since I've measured it but it really changed my outlook. And it, the first one made my outlook look like there is an answer. And the second one, my outlook was there's a price for certainty. And you gotta be very careful what price you pay to be certain. You gotta find that certainty within yourself, which I know is a lot of what you teach and I do as well, Jay. Yeah, thank you for walking us through that. Yeah. And especially going back a bit further as yeah. well. I think what I find fascinating about that, Tony, and a lot of the work you do is why does it, why do we as humans often wait to see, not even see pain. You saw pain in someone else and you try to help solve it. Yeah. And that got you working. Yeah. But why is it that we often wait to experience pain before we decide to change a part of our lives, make a different choice, to create a shift? Why is it that we wait so often for stress There's, and pressure? I, I had that question was burning in me because you know I was traveling around, had the privilege of this stage of life, you know, traveling around the earth, That's working why, with people yeah. from every walk of life, right? 100 plus countries I've worked in. And I'd see the same problems, even though you'd be in different cultures. Like, you know, go to an Asian culture, it's not about the individual, it's about the group, right? But I'd still see the same problems. And then I got obsessed with it, like, okay, what, what's the common human experience? Because I'm seeing the same problems, even though it's a different culture, even though it's different beliefs, right? And I began to realize that there are certain human needs. And there were six that I identified that I've used ever since, and it's helped me understand. And so one of those needs is certainty, and it's the base human need. Certainty that you can avoid pain and that you can be comfortable is the most basic need. It's a survival need, because if you have continuous pain, that's continuous damage. Continuous damage equals death, right? 
But what happens for people is most people, that first basic need is where they live. They don't grow. Another need, the second need is uncertainty. Because ironically, if you're certain all the time, you're bored out of your mind. If you're completely uncertain, you're kind of freaked out. And a balance is not it. It's the ability to use both, enter both worlds. And then there's the need for significance, which is a big part of our culture today, thanks to social media, um, that need to feel special, unique, important, right? It can be a very positive emotion or need. It can be very negative, depending upon how it's used, how it's directed. And then there's the need for connection and love, which everybody has. And those four needs, everybody finds a way to meet. If you have to lie to yourself, work 20 hour days, you're gonna find certainty somehow. You're gonna find wide variety. You're gonna find some form of significance. Some people do it by tearing other people down. Some people do it by working harder, you know, it's different. You're gonna find some level of at least connection, if not love. But the final two are what make people feel alive, which is growing, everything in the universe grows or dies, and contributing. Everything in the universe contributes or is eventually eliminated by evolution. So those are the spiritual needs, growth and contribution, where you get beyond yourself. And I think that the majority of us don't take moves because of fear, and fear is just uncertainty. Mm -hmm. It's that base need. And when I go around and I describe this in more detail, and I work with a big audience, 15, 20,000 people, and I'll say, have them do a set of exercises, and have them figure out where do they get, what triggers them to be certain or uncertain, what triggers them to have variety, and so forth. So they understand that like everything I do is to meet these needs. But then I get them to say, what are your top two? Not what you think they should be, not what you want them to be, what are they? And 90% of the people in our culture are certainty and significance or significance and certainty. Mm -hmm. Even though they really want love. Mm -hmm. So they have this route, like if I can be successful enough, then I'll be worthy of it. Mm -hmm. Or if I can just control it enough and know it's that way, but you can't control love, right? And so most people are, they're trying to meet their needs in a kind of a backwards way. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that fear, that uncertainty is what keeps most people from growing until they get enough pain. And then that pushes them through a threshold where their needs aren't being met, they gotta change. And unfortunately, most people wait till they have enough pain. Now, I, that's not my preference. <laughs> I'm sure it's not yours, but I'm sure you've had experiences as much as I've had where you did have to be pushed that far to get there, right? Yeah, by the way, I'm so glad I asked you that question because that's the best answer I've ever heard. Oh, <laughs> it's brilliant. Uh, simple. It's, it's, it's simple, but it's, it's profound as well because usually we would say, oh yeah, the reason why we wait till we don't have to change is because we're comfortable and we're okay with it. But really, it's because you're saying these needs keep us trapped almost. In fact, if you're, if you're wanting to change but not changing, it's because some of your needs are met by what you're doing yeah. and some of them aren't. Yeah. That's why you're in that push-pull, but you don't usually do enough until you're pushed over the edge. Like yes. smoking a cigarette, what does it give people? Comfort, because just take a breath of cigarette, you take a nice, slow, deep breath in and take it out, it calms the nervous system, right? It's something that they're comfortable with. It's variety, if they're all stressed out and then they start to breathe differently, it's variety in the body. For some people, they did originally for significance. I'm cool, I'm smoking. Or today, it's not really that cool to most people, but for some generations, some places it is. Some people see it as a connection with themselves. Mm -hmm. But if all of a sudden you're now in a relationship with somebody who doesn't smoke, and you really love them, and you want their total love and attention, and they're completely disgusted by cigarettes, now my needs for love, yes. right, are really strong, and my need for this comfort is really strong, and so you have this push-pull. Mm -hmm. And then some people make the shift, some people don't. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Well, what you said to me really rung a bell for me and we spoke a bit about it earlier. Like I came to a point in my life, there was one point earlier when I, when I left the monastery where I really struggled with my health, which I've spoken about before, but even more recently, and it's interesting, you were 31, I'm, I'm 34 now, and, wow. and it was probably around a similar time, 30, maybe around 30 years old, where I realized that I had two choices. I either had to slow down or I had to up my focus on my health. Right. And that's why I'm so excited about this book for the yeah. world to read. Yeah. Because you're giving us opportunities and access to thought and ideas and practices and medicine that can help us up our game of our health. Yeah. Because Absolutely. often what we do is we choose to slow down. We yeah. choose to just go, okay, well, I'm just gonna do less. Yeah. And you and I, I think we both connect on the fact that actually giving and service and contribution and yeah. making an impact on such big needs, yeah that I was just like, I don't want to stop though. Like just as you said with the energy point, I, yeah. I don't want to not be able to do as much and give more. Yeah. So how do I change my health? And that simple decision, it's what led me to be attracted to what you're doing in this book and the work in this area. Talk to, a bit, talk to us a bit about that energy piece. In the book, you talk a lot about yeah. boosting your energy yeah. through natural compounds. Yes. And when I was reading about this, I was fascinated because we're not hearing about this everywhere. If somebody were to tell you five years ago that you could reverse aging, people would laugh at you. 
But today, there are billions and billions of dollars being spent by the richest people in the world, mostly in Silicon Valley, and some of the greatest scientists in the world have been breakthroughs in the last five years that are amazing. So there's a man named Dr. Sinclair, David Sinclair from Harvard. He's probably the number one longevity expert in the world, and I write about him in the book. And one of the things is he's 53 chronologically, but he's 33 biochemically. I've applied what he's taught me for six months now, since I met him seven months, maybe eight months now, and I'm 62, but I'm 51. My goal is to get it down to 41 or 42 if I possibly can. But you go, how's that possible? Well, there are ways of reversing, you know, you're, everybody knows their body's made of stem cells, I'm sure by now. And there's ways of reversing the process of a stem cell, literally from skin back to pluripotent, where it can become anything. The man who did that was Dr. Yamanaka, he won the Nobel Prize for it. David Sinclair took his work, applied it to reversing the aging, and he started with mice. And he took these mice that had um, glaucoma, so they burned out the nerves in the eyes, and those don't regrow. And he's the first time, he'll probably win a Nobel Prize from this, he reversed the aging process and grew back their eyes so they have sight again, to give you an idea. Uh, they're using gene therapy. There's a young man that I interviewed in the book there who was on um, America's Got Talent, who was blind, who now can see by this gene therapy. These are the types of things that just sound like magic. The book is filled with things where I interviewed 150, of the smartest scientists, Nobel laureates, regenerative doctors and scientists to show you what's happening right now that you might think would happen 20 or 30 years from now, it sounds like magic, or within 36 months. That's what it's all really based on. But I'll, I'll, here's what I want your, your audience to understand about energy. So everybody's heard of the genome or their DNA, right? You can think of the genome as being like the piano keys, but the music is played by a player, which is the epigenome. Epa means above. And the epigenome is affected by your diet, your exercise, how much exposure to radiation, etc. Well, most people have heard that. But the epigenome really is governed by seven master genes. They're called sirtuins. Now, your audience doesn't have to remember all these names. <laughs> <laughs> but just stay with me. Just think there's seven master genes that do three or four things that are critical. First, they convert. They turn on and off the different genes in your body. That's the epigenome. And if you turn on the wrong ones, you age too soon or your energy drops. So when this is fully fueled, when those sirtuins are doing their job, everything happens in the right way. Second thing they do is they reduce your inflammation, which is the basis of most breakdown in the body. Third thing they do, which is critical, is they help your mitochondria, which is the energy force inside every cell in your body, convert food into energy, into ATP. Pretty important. And then they have a separate task, that is they clean up your DNA. So at 35 or 34, you have a certain amount of exposure, more than when you were 20. Mm -hmm. When you're 50, it'll be even higher, 60 even higher. Well, around 40, your stem cells drop off the cliff. Around 50, the sirtuins, the fuel of those sirtuins drops off the cliff, and that's called NAD, which I'm sure some of your people have heard about, you may have even spoken about. You can do NAD as an IV. It doesn't absorb a lot, though. Mm. NAD, though, has a precursor called NMN, like Never Mother Never, I'm sure you've heard of it. And so I've known about that. And so, but I didn't understand that if you don't have enough NAD in an in, 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 then the body has to decide between, do I help the body turn on to epigenome? Do I help it reduce inflammation? There's only so much. Do wow. I really help it create enough energy in the cell? Or do I clean up the DNA? So imagine you have a mansion and you have I a young staff that. and your house looks perfect all the time because they're young and bright and they're on top of things, but no one notices, they clean it up. But as they get older and slower, and then there's less resources, NAD, now the mansion starts to break down. That's aging. So what Dr. Sinclair did is figure out how to supplement that NMN. And you can go buy NMN on the, you know, what you look on Amazon even, and there's probably a list of a dozen or so brands that do it. So we tested six of them just for price points as of $39 a month to $129 a month. And there was no NMN in any of them. And I asked the lab guy, I said, are these people just thieves? He goes, well, most of it comes from China, so I can't say for sure. He said, but what I can tell you is what's more likely is NMN breaks down in less than 30 days. So by the time it comes from China, gets to your door, there's nothing in it. So they built a more stable NMN, which we have and use, but there's something coming on what your, your audience know about. Little shut up, I've talked about it so long. No, this is amazing, so, this so is important. fascinating, yeah. So there's a company called Microbiotech uh, and Eden Rock, this merger of these two companies. They saw the power of NMN, and they said, if you could find an NMN that was stable, and was even more absorbable, it would transform people. So for example, in a mouse, they give NMN to mice and they live 30% longer. So not all mice studies transfer to humans. They take a, an old mouse, like a 70 year old person, be like a 20 month old mouse, okay? So that's an old mouse. 
and they put them on a treadmill, and the most they can run without collapsing is about a quarter of a kilometer. A young dynamic mouse, like a 21-year-old, can run four times that, a full kilometer. Wow. 14 days on NMN, and the old mouse, the 70-year-old mouse, will run two to three kilometers, 200 to 300% more. So again, I read about this, I was like, well, will that really transfer to humans? Yeah. So this has been the breakthrough that only happened a few months ago, right before I published the book. The Special Forces in Boston for two years has been doing a private study that's been top secret about using this new form of NMN that's called MIB-626. And it'll be available in 18 to 24 months. Wow. But it got, it got out because the commander, they just finished the two-year study. First year was safety, second year was efficacy. And the commander was debriefing his team and didn't realize there was a newspaper person in the room. So part of it got out, it was in the Daily Mail a couple weeks ago also, and they only know a part of it. I can't tell you the things I'm an investor in the company, I can't tell you what's not public, but I'll tell you what's public. What the commander said was, here's what I can tell you gentlemen, what happens with mice happens with the most powerful men and women in the world, I meaning the most conditioned men in the world saw massive increases in endurance, just from taking the seminar, massive increase in muscle strength without any more stimulation, and most importantly, increased cognitive ability, which when you're a soldier, what's going to get you to stay alive when you're exhausted or beat up or injured or complete the mission is going to be your brain. So they're now doing studies on COVID with it. They're doing studies uh, with groups of 40 to 60 year olds that are just unconditioned and they're seeing the same result. So in 18 to 24 months, the FDA will have, this will not be a nutraceutical. This will be a, something, go to your doctor and imagine you get something that is natural, but you put it in your body and now all four of those things I told you about are going full tilt. Now you're turning on and off the right genes. Now inflammation's coming down. You've got more energy at a cellular level and your DNA's being cleaned up. So that's less than two years away from us right now. That's incredible. So you first approach it through behavior change. Now you're changing the actual part of it. Yeah, do both. Yeah, do and both. And that's amazing. Yes. And, and do you think though that, and putting together both those approaches that you've invested in, from a point of view of your whole career and what you're working yeah. on now, how much is that change of behavior still going to be required? Because my worry is, as you know, is people say, okay, I'm gonna take this pill and it's gonna drop my inflammation, but then I'm gonna eat things that create more inflammation. Yeah. Like, how does behavior change go hand in hand with that? I found that when people have more energy, I don't know what your experience is, that their behaviors change. Yes. When you're low energy, kind of lethargic, even the way you think, I mean, look at what COVID's done, but you have people coped up and not moving very much, yes. right? I've had a chance to use this product. Uh, we, there's products available right now with NMN, I've been using those and they're very powerful, but this one is even more visceral. I mean, it, you feel like you're ready to buzz around. I cannot just, wait. <laughs> it's like, it, it blows my mind what it does, right? So I think when people feel like that, my experience is, they tend to develop different patterns. It's just like if you've ever gone on a cleanse, even for a short time, your palate changes and all of a sudden you don't like the things that you once liked. So my hope is for people there, but I don't just rely on that as you know, because yeah. I teach people all the other ways to shift their life. But I think it's important to know that there are some tools available right now and some coming very quickly That's that will answer. radically change the value of your health. And also regardless of your age, it's the whole idea is like to be able to take as you get older to stay younger physiologically mm -hmm. and psychologically and emotionally incredibly priceless. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic though, because that specific idea that once you've had the taste yes. of what energy feels, feels like, like, we all know that we make better decisions when we yeah. experience that. And so even if that can give people that shift, yes. if this is how you could feel, this is yes. how you are feeling now, yes. then we can make better choices moving forward. And most forward. people also, if they're gonna find out about it, they've been pursuing something anyway, right? Yes. So yes. it's like someone's gonna pick up the book, Life Force, they're looking for yes. answers. They want more energy or more strength, or they wanna help somebody in their family that's dealing with a real issue, and they wanna know the best. So it's like an encyclopedia. It's yeah, it is. This is, this is what I was saying pages. offline. I was like, this is an encyclopedia. I was saying, I was saying to Tony, I was like, I was reading parts of each chapter, but this is truly an encyclopedia. By the way, the cartoons make it unencyclopedic, but these are brilliant. They're hilarious and, yeah. and they, they truly crack you up. So uh, one of the things I wanted to dive into you with, Tony, was that same thing that I experienced, and I want to hear it from your perspective. You've been biohacking for a long time. What are a few things that you've shifted in your behavior that have created more energy? Yes. That shifts that actually helped you expand your energy, right? Yes. Like you said, you're serving more people right now. Yeah. But even when you are traveling, you're moving around the world, you're coaching sports teams, you're coaching individuals, you have groups. Yeah. How have you been able to expand your energy year over year? What are some of the simple tweaks 
that people could do today while yes. they wait for this amazing product. I but, well, there's products now, they yes, now, yes. But, but for me, it's, you know, I was a vegan for about 10 years, and then I ate uh, fish and salad basically for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. So dietarily, I've always tried to make sure that what I had was as clean as possible to start with. Mm -hmm. Then I train like a crazy person. Um, you know, I do oxygen restriction training type of thing so that my capacity is strong. But I'm also trying to train so I can literally do two and a half marathons in, in a day and then another day, another day, another day. Um, for me, the most important thing I think has been for me is, believe it or not, has been a combination of hot and cold temperatures that I use. Like I start every single morning in the freezing water and I do it for two reasons. One is it moves every bit of blood in your body and all your lymph in your system, but also kind of train my brain to say, when I say go, we go. You know, it's like, it's, there's never a day I look forward to going in the water. But I have, you know, 56 degree water here, but in my home in Sun Valley, I go literally through the snow and get in the river, which is, you know, like 39, 40 degrees in the winter time. And, but you feel so incredible when you come out, but also it's just training your brain saying, I say go, we go. It's not like, oh, I'm not ready yet, or let me wait five minutes. And that becomes a discipline in your mind for everything else in your life, which is huge. And then, believe it or not, saunas, I just in the last year I've started using saunas and they've seen a huge change. I've always known about saunas. I use them you know, every now and then. But there's so much research on it now and I have it in the book that'll blow your mind. Like four days a week in the sauna for just 20 minutes at 160 degrees plus, whether it's a, you know, a laser type sauna, red sauna going in or, it's, or a traditional one, will absolutely change your health in more ways than you can imagine. Like people that don't really work out, I can get them to do this now and they just go sit in the sauna. But what happens, it reduces your chance of a heart attack by over 51%. I read that, yeah. Wow. It reduces your chance of a stroke by 62%. Your overall health is reduced. I mean, it, and then here's the thing I've noticed that happens with people I get doing this. They wouldn't work out. Now they do the sauna and they put some music on or they put a movie in the background or something. And the great thing is after doing it for about a month, sweating and everything else, now they want to work out. Now they want to do something else. So I look for the things, the quick little hacks that can make it happen. In my life, I also use cryotherapy, mm -hmm. and cryotherapy takes your body down to minus 250, you know, Fahrenheit, takes out, like, you know, I used to ice myself, because after an event, I've been, you know, running up and down the stadium walls and everything else, every ounce of me, 14 hours on stage, 12 hours on stage is gone, and I go, go ice like I did in football. You know, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, it's painful, but I had to do it. Now I go in for two and a half minutes in a cryotherapy unit and there's no inflammation in my body. It's just mind-boggling. For people who have uh, osteoarthritis also, uh, like my mother-in-law had such bad osteoarthritis, even medications weren't helping her and she was crying at night. And I was like, I gotta find an answer. That's how I found cryo. And I started reading about cryotherapy and started reading of athletes doing it, but I started reading what it does for osteoarthritis. She has no pain now, right? So they're just tools and you don't have to own one of these things. Yes, you know, yes, I'm fortunate yes. enough to have one here. But you know, you can go, there's local places all over the United States, all over the world now, where yeah. you can just go in five or 10 minutes and it's amazing. People just need to try it out. So there's lots of different tools. There's exercises you can do that I love They're called OsteoStrong. I invest in this company. It's a 10 minute workout. Sounds like total BS. This is the one that speeds up your metabolism. Yes, it, well, yeah. it also, it helps you build stronger bones, mm -hmm. which most people don't care about bones. Women understand, you know, in their fifties, osteoporosis is a really huge thing and most of the drugs will eventually fossilize the bones. This is the only thing that's been proven to increase bone density by about 14%. But my athlete friends love it, I love it because when your bones are stronger, your, your muscles are limited by your bone strength. Because otherwise your muscles will rip open the bone, right? So this is a 10 minute exercise. You do four different exercises and you go to a local place, you don't have to own the equipment, and literally you're done in that time. And you see the transformation. First time I did this, I remember I, was, I worked with this woman, she was about 63 years old, and I went to Gold's gym with her because he didn't have these machines then. There was a way of doing it with weights. It was a little bit spooky if you screwed up because the weight was so heavy. And there was this guy who was like, I don't know, 25, 26 years old, ponytail, sweating like crazy doing the leg press. And, uh, and we had a camera crew there and, and, uh, and she says, sir, uh, he took a break and he's sweating. She goes, sir, could I just get a quick set in between you? And she's in normal clothes and she's like 62 years old, 63 years old, and looked like she was almost 70. And he thought he was being punked, right? He gets up and she goes, would you put another 100 pounds on? Literally another 100 pounds on. And so there's a technique where you use an extreme amount of weight for a short period of time and it stimulates it. Because you don't get growth by working out. You get growth by rest. But you have to have a stimulus that's strong enough. And I started doing, you know, I, I bench press in those days like 240 pounds. And then all of a sudden I bench press 525. And I, I did 1,600 pounds on the leg press. And the guy from Gold's Gym came over to and filmed me. He's like, 
this, you're doing this with your mind. I was like, no, anybody, <laughs> anybody can do this. But now they have these machines, so you don't have to worry about the weight being too heavy or dropping on you. So there are these little tools mm. that can make you stronger, make you faster. Yeah. And then there's simple things I never did. Like I was working on the sleep chapter at 6.25 in the morning, and I had to be up in two and a half hours. I'm like, what's wrong with this, <laughs> with this picture? Because my whole thing was, I'll, I, I, my wife loves to sleep. Eight hours, she, yeah. nine hours she'd be thrilled. Yeah. My thing is I'll sleep when I die, right? right? Right, But then when I was doing the research for this book, I met this doctor who's the top neurobiologist over at, up in, in Northern California. He works for Google and everybody else. He's considered the top sleep doctor in the world. And he says, Tony, I think I can convince you. And I said, good luck. <laughs> Give me your best shot. And he said, well, I did a study, we got a study with 1.6 billion people on sleep. And I go, you couldn't have possibly coordinated that. And he goes, I didn't have to. It's all the countries, 70 countries that have daylight savings times. Wow. And he said, here's what you got to do, his name's Dr. Walker. He says, he says, Tony, all you got to do is look at the real numbers. Let me show you the numbers. And he showed me that for three days after we spring forward, you lose one hour. In every country in the world, on average, heart attacks increase 24%. And when we fall back and you get one extra hour, all around the world in 70 countries, on average, 21% decrease in heart attacks. And then he does the same stats on accidents and everything else. And then he showed me stats that show, you know, a man that slept four and a half, five hours a night, like I was doing, usually had testosterone levels by somebody 10 years older than they were, that got my attention. So it's a combination of sleep, it's a combination of the right diet, it's a combination of the right stimulus of exercise. It's really doing those fundamentals that make a difference for you. And then it's doing these cool things like stem cells that completely changed my life. Yeah. What do, what do you think, having said that, what do you think is the greatest human skill? Not habit, but mindset and skill. That's a great question. I don't know if I got the, what the greatest, there's so many. It depends on what you want out of your life, right? Yeah. But I think the ability to manage your own mind and emotions is probably one of the single most important. And maybe the second is the ability to influence others because that's what makes you a leader. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you're doing that for a higher good because <laughs> there are all kinds of leaders as you know. But I think, I don't think most people are very good at, at emotional fitness. Mm -hmm. Most people are just not as happy as they could be. You know, I did one book, Money Master the Game. It's kind of like this. Yes. Only and what I did in that case is I interviewed you know 50 of the smartest financial people in the world: yes. Ray Dalio, Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett. And out of 50 of them, and I, you know, again, it's in my judgment I could be completely wrong. And I've spent a lot of time with them. Some have become really good friends. There's probably four or five that are really happy people. You go, oh, well, money makes people unhappy. Oh, money it has nothing to do with money. Money makes you more of what you are. It just magnifies. If you're mean, you have more to be mean with. If you're kind, you have more to give. You know. But I think that most people are just. They haven't learned to manage what's going inside. Doesn't matter how much abundance they have, they're still unhappy. We've all seen people that, great comedians, have killed themselves. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, beautiful man, traveled the world, killed himself, you know. Um, you know, fashion designers that have done it. We've all seen all these different people, Kate Spade. And it's like, what? They had everything. Except they didn't master what was going on here and here. And, and you know, this is why you lived your life the way you have as, as well. So I think. That skill set is the most important one. That's why even in the book, my last two chapters, I think are the most important because it's really about the power of the mind. Because mm -hmm. like everybody knows about placebos, right? Mm -hmm. They were only discovered in World War II. And it was discovered by accident. This doctor ran out of morphine and he's treating these, these people that are badly injured. And you know, you need the morphine not just so they're out of pain, but so they don't go into shock. Mm -hmm. And the actual person who discovered this gets no credit was the nurse, because the nurse handed him a syringe and said, we've got some more morphine. So he believed it, and he said, you'll be out of pain in just less than a minute. Wow. He injected them, and in every case, none of them went into shock. 90% of them were out of pain, and they used nothing. It was saline, right? So after World War II, he went back to Harvard, and he was the person that created what we now consider to be the double-bind studies, which are always compared to a placebo, right? And what most people don't know is, the bigger the placebo intervention, the more powerful the mind believes it. So a small pill is less effective than a big pill. Um, an injection is more powerful than a pill in terms right. of its effectiveness. The most powerful is a, is a sham surgery. Um, the, the Veterans Administration did a study and they did it on people doing knee surgeries and they took one third of the people and they just cut them open, anesthetized them, and sewed them back up, did nothing. A year later, this group, the group that had no surgery, had the least amount of pain, the most amount of flexibility, the most amount of, so they stopped funding those surgeries to give you an idea. But that's how powerful it is. And so when you, it's even more than Harvard did a study where they took barbiturates, made these big red pills, 
and said, this is an amphetamine. You need to prepare your body because you're going to speed up. They didn't give him something fake. They gave him an actual drug that slows the body down and the body sped up. So most people don't understand the power of the mind. And so what I try to do is show people, even in this book, here are the things that you can do to take control of your mind. Because if you take care of your body and then you don't take care of your mind and emotions, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. Who cares? Sure, yeah. What spawned that question was something you said. You said that you start your morning by jumping in the cold. That's right. And you never feel like doing it. And you said that, I just say to my body, it's time to go. That's right. And that's what sparked the question because I was like, that's a really interesting skill that yes. you've trained yourself to be okay with discomfort. Yes. You're training yourself as your first skill of the day is, yes. I am okay with uncomfortable things. Yes. And I know I can get through them. Yes. And that to me is what sounds like a really important part of emotional fitness. It is, because unless you can push through discomfort, most things that are going to give you the greatest reward require discomfort initially, yeah. right? And the discomfort, it's like, you know, my original teacher, Jim Rohn, used to always say, you know, there's two pains in life, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Mm. He goes, discipline weighs ounces, regret weighs tons, you know? And <laughs> yeah, so well, I've, I've trained myself to do that. And then, and then I meditate. Then I always make an acknowledgement call briefly or leave a voicemail for someone just because to spark the day. And then I do the first thing I do is always whatever is the most difficult. Yes. Because then you have momentum for your day. And when you train your brain to do what's difficult first, then emotional fitness just comes naturally. And more importantly, so does achievement. So does your ability to contribute to other people. Because I have 105 companies now, to give you an idea. I manage 13 of them directly, you know, ongoingly. And you know, there are all kinds of different industries from AI to you know, my resorts in Fiji to sports teams I own. And I mean, it's insane the, the, the dichotomy of them. We're doing $7 billion in business. So I got to do that while I'm being a good dad to five kids and five grandkids, while I'm taking care of my body, while I'm living my normal mission. So if I don't take care of my body and my energy and my mind, I mean, you'd be overwhelmed by all the demands because listen, all I got to do is pick up my phone and you're going to have all kinds of, oh, that's cool. Oh, shit, that's it. But, you know, what are the chances with thousands of employees on three, four different continents now that somebody's messing up? If messing up is not what I think they should be doing, it's 100%. <laughs> so I'd always be in reaction until I train my brain to say, no, you know, problems are a sign of life <laughs> and all they are are challenges to be solved. And what makes you a great leader is your ability to solve problems or teach teams to build a culture where they can solve problems. And so it gives me this tremendous creativity and flexibility, but I've got the base of energy to make it work. Yes, yes, exactly. And you've given yourself the permission to say this, this matters first it before we get lost in the 7 billion and yeah. 105 companies yeah. and all of that. Yeah. And I think that permission is often the toughest part. Yeah. But, but one of the things that stood out to me was I sat down and this was a really beautiful answer that I want to share with you because I think it will spark where I want to go next. I interview a lot of Navy SEALs and I like sitting yes. down with people who've had extreme experiences Me because too. I feel that extreme experiences have opened up different parts of the brain, different parts of the body that we've yep. never had. And the spirit. And the spirit too, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And one of the people I sat down with was Jocko Willink. Yes, I love and, You know, he's been a leader for 25 years yeah. and yeah. Um, um, incredible Navy SEAL, highly accomplished. And I asked him, and we were on Zoom, right? This was during the pandemic, so I didn't yeah. even get to have this yeah. with him. Yeah. And that's why I'm so grateful for this. Me too. I sat with him and I said to him, I said, you've done everything that's difficult and uncomfortable, potentially known to human beings yeah. in, in your field. What's the most difficult thing you've ever done? Mm. And I didn't, I didn't know what to expect, and I never do. I try not to project or predict what I think someone's gonna say. And he said to me, he said, the most difficult thing that I've been through is watching a fellow trooper go down next to me yeah. and having to carry on the mission yeah. without getting the moment to save, yeah. to mourn, yeah. to hold, to carry. He goes, I just have to continue the mission. Yeah. And that was just an answer that, you know, he could have said, oh, I was like standing in the cold water, I was doing this, I was doing that. And so I wanted to ask you, what was the most difficult thing when you know all this and you've seen someone's pain and either they weren't willing to apply it, you saw them too late. Has there been someone in your life that you're like, I had all these tools to help them with, but they weren't ready to receive or that it wasn't accessible at that time for them? Has there been that? Or, or have you found that you've always found a way to get through and not even you personally, I mean, yeah. in your personal life too. Yeah, I first of all, I identify, I agree with what Jacques told you, which is, um, you know, dealing with the loss of someone you care about is probably the most difficult thing of all. I would say maybe, uh, as a child, seeing the level of frustration between my parents, you know, I had four different fathers, and watching them kind of, um, 
you know, accept whatever life gave them. As a, it's, it's why a lot of my drive came about is seeing my father's be berated by my mother, who I love dearly, um, and just watching them break down. Like you know, I, the, the, probably the single most painful event of my life, but also shaped me in such a beautiful way was when I was 11 years old, we had no money for food and it was Thanksgiving, which in America is a you know, big holiday feast. Mm -hmm. And so we'd been without food before, we'd have crackers and butter, and, you know, we survived. But we weren't gonna have a Thanksgiving feast. And there was a knock at the door and I go to the door and there's this giant guy there with groceries in each hand. We had a pot beside him on the ground with an uncooked turkey. And I, I just like, I said, uh, who are you here for? He goes, I'd like to speak to your father. And my mom and dad were yelling at each other, saying things that you can never take back. And I'm trying to make sure my younger brother and sister, they're five and seven years younger, wouldn't hear any of this. And that day changed my life because I thought it was going to be the most exciting day. Dad, dad, go to the front. What is it? I said, it's for you. You answer it. No, it's for you. I remember I opened the door and I was just so excited to see my father be happy. Like, we're going to have a feast. This is going to be incredible. And he got angry. And he's like, we don't accept charity. He went to slam the door in the man's face. And the man's foot was there, so it bounced off his foot. He still opened the groceries. He's like, sir, I'm just the delivery guy. He said, it's, it's not charity. Everybody has a tough time. Someone bought this, and they're sending it to you as a gift. My father said, we don't take charity. He goes to close the door again. This time, the guy's shoulder was there also, so it bounced off again. And then I was standing right there, and there was this moment I'll never get where the, this man <laughs> looked at my father. And he looked at me and he said, sir, don't let your ego make your family uh, uh, suffer. And the veins on my dad's face on the, on the side of his neck, I'll never forget, they bulge. I, like his face turned around. I thought I was gonna punch him in the face. And then there's this moment, my dad's shoulders dropped. He took the groceries, slammed the door, didn't say thank you, and stormed off. And I just remember thinking, like, how come he's not happy? You know, you talk about pain. It's like, I love my father so much. And he, he, there's basically three decisions that I think everybody makes in their life, that whether they're aware of it or not, moment to moment. I figured this out afterwards because I was so obsessed with what's wrong because he eventually left our family. And that was the most painful thing I ever had. So it's like feeling like I failed, you know, I blame myself, like why couldn't I get through to my father? You know, I was 11 years old. But later on, it helped me understand that three decisions are first, you gotta decide what to focus on. Every moment of your life, there's something grabbing your focus and you don't experience life, you experience the part of life you focus on. Right? What's wrong is always available, so is what's right, right? And there are different kinds of focus. And my dad's focus that day was really on what he hadn't done. And I know that because he kept muttering it. And I hadn't taken care of his family. There's no funny for Thanksgiving. Somebody had to give us charity. And then the second decision you make about once you focus on something is what does it mean? Is this the end or the beginning? If you think it's the end of a relationship, you're going to behave different than it's the beginning, right? Um, my dad's meaning was that he was worthless. And so then the third decision is, what do I do? Which, whatever meaning you come up with creates the emotions which affects what you do. And what you decide to do is leave our family. But for me, it was like, this is amazing. I mean, you know, we haven't having Thanksgiving. You know, this is, this is incredible. We got food, what a concept. And then the meaning though is what changed my whole life, which was, wow, strangers care. That completely changed my life. That painful experience, I couldn't deny that somebody who wanted no credit deliver this food to my family. And so what I decided to do is say, someday I'm gonna do this for another family. So when I was 17, I had two families and it was a, a euphoric experience. I went in jeans and a t-shirt, I didn't go like the delivery guy, but I wanted to see the face of the people. And then next year was four people, and then it was eight. And I literally, my thing was doubling. And I had a little company, and then I got to a million people a year, and then I got to four million people a year. Then when I was doing Money Master the Game, I'm interviewing these billionaires, Jay, and I'm watching Congress cut food stamps. It's now called the SNAP program by, I think it was $6 billion. So every family that actually needs food, and my family was one of those back then, they all have to come up with a week's worth of food out of every month. So I was like, I called my team and I said, how many people have I fed in my lifetime? I didn't know that it was 42 million meals. I was like, this is pretty cool. And I was like, what if I fed 50 million people, like my entire lifetime in one year? And I was like, what if I did 100 million? What if I fed a billion people in 10 years? So that was seven years ago. We're at 850 million meals. Right? And I'm gonna hit the billion earlier than what my promised and targeted, and then I've got a sustainable approach. But I tell you that because my worst day was my best day. My, the most painful day, the day where I felt like I'd do the least, where I felt impotent, led me to have new understandings, new skills, new capacities, new drives, new hunger. I mean, would I really be feeding 100 million people a year 
100 million meals a year if I was well fed as a child? Probably not. And you know, I'd love to believe I'm such a perfect person, but no, I'm just, <laughs> I just know what suffering feels like, so I don't want anybody else to suffer, you know? So I think sometimes the suffering experiences of our life, if we don't let them crush us, we let them drive us, they, they actually become the best day of your life. And picking your worst day and making your best day is a beautiful target for anybody. That, that is just, it's magical even hearing it. It's a magical it's, experience. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it yeah, it's, my life. yeah, exactly. I you can know? only imagine, like, just hearing yeah. it, I'm just, you know, it's such a beautiful visual. So to live it is just, you know, on the other end of that. Thank you for sharing that so oh, much. It's, it's such thank a, it, it's so profound and so wonderful with the, with the it, questions. It's that what I you see. It's what you see. There's grace in life too. It's yeah. like if you can, like, I used to think in the early days because my mom was beautiful. She was the most influential person in my life, and yet she also, when she drank alcohol and took, uh, you know, prescription medication, she got crazy. So she smashed my head against the wall until I bled or feed me liquid soap. And I never told anybody about this when she's alive, but I had this group of young kids that you could see a tall white guy who seems to be quite successful. You know, what does he know? So I told him the whole story. But out of all that, it's like if my mom had been the mother I wanted her to be, yeah. I'd probably not be the man I'm proud to be. Yes. Like I, I had to grow, I had to become a practical psychologist at 11 to manage her so that my brother and sister weren't messed up. And it's like, there's grace in everything. And it's, I always think it's like, it's our job to realize that life's happening for us, not to us. Mm -hmm. And to find how it's happening for us, that's our job. If we do that, then we have a magical life. If we don't, but if your energy's low and you're exhausted, then you don't, you don't find those empowering meanings. Yeah. You know, that's why to me, you can't separate the mind and the body. Yes. You, yes. Gotta, you gotta feed the mind and strengthen the body. Yeah on a daily basis in some way. And if you do that, life can be pretty miraculous. Yeah, and I did that for too long. I, I can actually relate to that. It was my wife that turned me onto the body mm. because I was one of those people that focused on the mind and the spirit. Right. And as I shared with you earlier, yes. ignored the body. Yeah. Because I thought, well, I'm young. I've always been healthy. I don't really know what physical health looks like. Yeah. And then my wife is a nutrition, a dietitianist, oh, and I already awesome. health counselor, counselor. She comes into my life and she's just like, you need to do this, 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 this. You need to change this in your diet. <laughs> And I'm thinking, why are you asking me to change? But it was so fascinating to me because it's exactly what you just said. Yes. You can't disconnect the two. And going on that, you said focus and mood about your father. Yes. You have a whole section in here dedicated to focus and mood. Yes. Walk us through that because what you just explained to us is the emotional focus and mood yes. of your father. Yes. But here you're talking about how the physicality of focus and mood can affect us. They, they, go, they go together. Yeah. I'll give you an example of how powerful they are for the psychological side. Uh, right now, you know, out of COVID, so many people have been shut down, a terrible place. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen that um, drug overdoses are the largest they've ever been in history. There's over 100,000 people last year. Suicides, one out of four kids under the age of 30, according to the CDC, whether they're accurate or not, I don't know, have considered suicide sometime in the last two years. Because we all need a compelling future. We need to look something to look forward to. So Stanford came to me, and the, their genetics lab has been doing research on depression. And what they found was that our, by doing meta studies is only 40% of the people who go in for therapy, who they get drugs and therapy together usually, only 40% make any improvement. 60% don't improve at all. That's not a lot more than what you can get on some placebos. And so uh, they approached me and said, a couple of people went through one of your programs. One was clinically depressed. They're not anymore. But we don't have any science on this. Would you be willing to let us do a science test? And I said, sure. So they came out to the State of Destiny Seminar I do, which helps people to change their values and belief structures. I don't tell them what they need to be, but they figure out what it needs to be. And it changes the way you perceive life, the way you experience life, how you feel, what you do. It's a rewiring of your model of the world, basically, in six days. And so they said, we're going to model this after the greatest breakthrough we found in science and no one able to follow up on. They, about two years ago, Johns Hopkins did a study on depression. And they gave people psilocybin, right, which comes from magic mushrooms. And they did therapy for 30 days. And at the end of it, 53% of the people were depression free 30 days later. Never happened. Like when we say 40% are helped, the average amount of help is 50% less depressed, right? That's what the average is. Some people completely turn around, some people don't. In this one, 53% of the people, so it's four times the result of any drug that ever been done. But unfortunately, psilocybin is not legal, so they're still working on them. And they said, we're gonna copy that exact study. And we're gonna have a, a group that they compared to, which is, didn't go to the seminar, the comparison group is gonna do gratitude journaling and so forth, because positive psychology talks about that. And they said, that's probably what this seminar does, is just positive thinking. Well, the cool thing was when they came out, the results were so amazing at Stanford that 
They went and had two new additional double-blind people do the research because it just seemed so ridiculous. <laughs> At the end of oh, the first week, 63% of people had no, had no uh, depression symptoms. At the end of six weeks, it can cr increase through time. 100% of the people had no, no depression symptoms. 19% of the people had uh, suicidal ideation. Zero had suicidal ideation. It blows away any study. It just came out, it's coming out next week in the Psychiatric Journal, which is Journal of American Medical Association, Psychiatric Journal are the two top journals in the field. They can't even believe it, so they're going to do more. And, and the, the actual scientific article says this is more powerful than any drug therapy or any forms of normal therapy combined. And what are we doing? We're getting people to change basically those three questions to some extent. Because your values control what you focus on. If you're security driven and you're here down in my basement right now, you're like, <laughs> where, where's the exit, right? You came down a slide, like, how do I get out of here, right? If you're adventure driven, you don't care. You don't even know where it is. So your focus is controlled by your values and your belief systems, right? The meaning of things is controlled by your belief systems. So those three decision-making things, you know, what I'm gonna focus on, what does it mean, what I'm gonna do, shift. And one good example of this, Jay, is and maybe your audience can relate to this, is that we just took three patterns. So let's say focus, most people have a focus either on what they have or what's missing. We both, we all do both. Mm -hmm. But what do you think most people focus on more often? What they have or what's missing? What's missing. That's right. Now, even achievers do that. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like somebody who's not successful. It's one of the reasons you see these achievers that no matter what they do, it's never enough. Let's think about it. If you're always focusing on what's missing from your life, how can you sustain happiness? It's software that will not allow that. You'll feel happy for a little moment and then you'll notice it's missing again. Um, what do you think is more often people focus on what they can control or can't control? What they can't control. Yeah. In my seminars, it's can control. That's why they go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to learn how to take control of my body or my finances or my business, whatever it is. So it's the opposite. But the average person, it's what they can't control. And with COVID, there's so much you can't control around you that people really sunk in that. Well, how's someone going to feel? Just everyone think about it. If you're constantly focused on what's missing from your life and what you can't control, and then I'll add one more. Do you focus more on the past, the present, or the future? We all do all three, but we tend to have one we focus more on. Where do you think more people focus? That's right. And achievers focus on the future, and happy people on the present. <laughs> so, so the, you know, if you're going to be an achiever, the ideal is the present so you experience it, anticipating the future so you can shape your life, right? Yeah. But the past you can change. So I ask people in seminars, you got a stadium 15, 20,000 people, and I'll say, how many of you know somebody that takes antidepressants and they're still depressed? And 80% of the room raise their hand saying they know somebody. Wow. Well, how come? Because all antidepressants do is numb you so that you're less intense, but they don't deal with the source of the problem, which is you're constantly seeing what's missing. And it doesn't matter whether you're successful or not. That's why there are these people that have been wealthy and think their own life. They see what's missing. They focus on all the things they can't control. There's plenty we can't control. But there's plenty we can influence and plenty we can't control. Just a couple of changes like that completely change someone's life. And so those changes in the beliefs and values change what they look moment to moment, change their experience of life. They're no longer depressed. Yeah, the biggest thing that I learned from that, apart from all the incredible stuff you said, is I didn't think about security once when we came down this line. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's either because I trust you a lot, and I'm with you. If it was someone else telling me to get down the slide, I don't know if I would have done it. But now, now I'm like going, oh, wait a minute, we're underwater. Like now, yeah. now I'm starting to have all yeah, the thoughts. That's right. Uh, that's incredible. That's, yeah, that's, those questions are fascinating to me. And you were saying that the people that come to your seminars are people that are the opposite. And I think the same of the people that listen to this podcast. Sure. They're choosing to listen to this podcast. Because they want to take charge. Over just watching a show or right. binge watching another series. They're, they're here trying to take charge of That's that. Right. What kind of assurance can you give them that that mindset is one that they should keep watering? Because I feel that often, and you've probably heard this in your seminars time and time again, people are like, Tony, I'm trying. I read the book. I'm, I'm trying to put it into practice, but I still keep failing or I still yeah. keep struggling. Someone who's already on, but feels that failure, that rejection, that, yeah. that pushback, what can keep them going? I think it's understanding there's no replacement for persistence, as simplistic as that is. It's like, you know, disappointment either destroys you or drives you, and you have to decide which one it's going to be. If you don't consciously decide, there's always going to be more BS for you to deal with. And I think, but that's why I think, you know, when I do my events, the reason I do the 12 hours a day, it's not because I like talking. It's just that I can tell you something all day long or I can get you to build the muscle. 
Yes. And the build of the muscle is by experiencing. And I always tell people, a yes. belief yes. a belief's a poor substitute for an experience. Like I can have a belief about you, but not experience you. So I get to know who you are, right? The same thing's true as like, you have a belief about China, you have a belief about working out. So I try to give people experiences that are so profound. And then, you know, the, the studies they did, they found people 12 months later, 11 months later, they're still in the middle of COVID. They did my digital seminar. And you know, they measured my body like, the amount of times I jump, I jump a thousand times a day, and I weigh 282 pounds, and I come down four times the body weight, so it's a thousand pounds times a thousand pounds of pressure. I have my lactic acid, if you've ever been with a friend and you're running and you can't talk, the point you can't talk is the level four of lactic acid. I'm at an 18 still speaking. So they decided to do that on my audience, and they found an interesting pattern. It's the same group that works with some of the, you know, Super Bowl champions and some of the Stanley Cup champions and so forth. There's a ratio in the body of testosterone versus cortisol, the stress hormone. And when the ratio is balanced, they call it the championship bloodline, what our bloodstream, it literally gets you to follow through. So when they did my audience in my live seminar, they found that people literally mirror me all the way through the experience. That's phenomenal. Biochemically. That is phenomenal. But then wow. we did it on, we did it, you know, because all of a sudden, overnight they said to me, you know, we're going to San Francisco and the governor of California says, you can only have 10 people and we got 15,000. So I was like, we'll go to Vegas. They'll never <laughs> shut down Vegas. They shut down Vegas. So I was like, okay, we'll do 1,500 movie theaters with 10 people in them. They shut down the movie theaters. Like, okay, we'll go to a church in Houston. I got a buddy, I'll rent his church for 15,000 people. I'm not gonna keep Costco open and shut down the church. They kept Costco open and shut down the <laughs> church. So I finally said, okay, I'm not gonna do some crappy little webinar. So I get this vision, I'm gonna build this facility with 20 foot high LED screens, 50 feet wide all around me. I'm gonna call Eric Yon at Zoom. I'm gonna get him from 1,000 up to 25,000 people so I can interact with people live in real time. I'm gonna build an app so they can shake it. And the more people do it, the louder it gets so it's real. So I built this whole thing. So now we're doing bigger events than ever in our entire history, but they did the same measurements on them in different parts of the world and saw the exact same mirroring process. Wow. And the average person even would, digitally even just digitally. to clarify that yeah 71% yeah. um, of the people they had 71% drop in negative emotions 53% improvement in positive emotions and 11 months later in the middle of COVID it helped because it's a biochemical change so when people say oh I'm trying I, read, that's, I write books because it's, it's an easy entry point to people there's so much you can learn from a book but there's nothing like the experience that's why I do the events. Mm -hmm. And like this last two years, because of COVID, I did two like six day free events. We had 800,000 people attend for six days, just four weeks ago, because I just wanted people to have answers where they are. And then people start to see, they get momentum, but it's hard to do just reading something or watching a couple of, you know, you know 20 yeah. minute or 15 minute or five minute little pieces Video. on YouTube. Yeah. Those are great, they might inspire you, but a transformation requires immersion. It's like, yes. if you ask the average person, did you study a foreign language in school? Most people, oh yeah, high school, college, speak it, they don't. <laughs> but if you turn around and you said, okay, what if you wanna learn Italian and I just took you to Rome and dumped yeah. you off for six weeks yeah. with no teacher, you're gonna come back six weeks later speaking you know, Italian. So it's immersion. Mm -hmm. And if you wanna master something, I think that's the thing most people don't do. Yes. They read a little bit, they listen a little bit, they dip in and out. They don't go day and night, night and day in total immersion in something that transforms them and also, something that makes them push through their fears. Yes. Because in the end, that's the only thing that stops them. Everybody's got a story. I didn't know this person. I don't have the resources. They have all the things they don't have. Mm -hmm. But if you're resourceful, you can get the money, you can get the time, you can get the energy, you can get anything you want. And you've got to get over your fear to be resourceful. So we do experiences that are so physiologically profound mm -hmm. that those fears do not stop you anymore. Yeah. And that's, what, that's how we get people to get, you know, 10 years later, they're still transformed from an experience that was one weekend. The fact that people are mirroring you, that is, that my, you, even you digitally, see it on, on even a through curve, a screen, it's, it's, that it's, is mind blowing. It is mind blowing. And I, that's through a screen too. Yeah. That but, blew my mind even But more. you know what's really cool about the screens is like, if you're in my seminar, yeah. you're in a giant stadium and I'm a dot. I mean, <laughs> most people are watching me on a screen anyway, right? Unless you're in the front rows. And, but you know, I can see your eyes, I feel what's going on. I'm running around the building here. I can scan so many people and I see them in their home. I see them with their children. Yeah. I see the interaction with their husband or their wife. I see what they're eating. You know, it's just, it's, it, and I'm with them 12, 13 hours a day for three or four days. And we start here, for example, at 10 a.m. and we're in 195 countries. So we got one for 25,000 people, March 17th to the 20th here. And we will have people in Australia starting at midnight wow. and going till one in the afternoon the next day for four days. Wow. 
and people in, in, in Italy are doing it at a different time. So it's like, we literally have the whole world engaged. So that's been the, the blessing of COVID. It's like I always tell people, you use stress or stress uses you, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to figure out how to use COVID. Um, and I wanted to serve people and we found the way. But again, none of this happens when you don't have enough energy. Yes. Because your brain will just go, oh man, I tried to everything. Yeah, you walk yourself out <laughs> and of it. Give up. And, I, and I love, the thing I love about immersion and events or retreats is that you actually build friendships. That's like right. the community that's the community built. for sure the community of that accountability of we're doing this together we're that's growing right. together we're building together that there are people who think like me and that's look right. like me i'm intrigued tony at this stage in your life what do you look for in a friend i mean a friend yeah well, that's an interesting question yeah most of my friends are people that are unbelievably driven to contribute i mean i, I think mm. you know if you want an extraordinary life like you don't have to do that much to have a good life for yourself mm. so it's like most of us if you find something you care about more than yourself and I know you know what I'm talking about, Jay. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you want to serve something. Like you and I both, I think, see what we do as a calling. It's not a, it's not a work per se. It was work. I don't need to work another day of my life, but I'm called, you know? So I think my friends are people that are called. And my friends are people that are funny because <laughs> I love to laugh. Um, but they're just, I love, I'm the kind of guy, I'm so easy. If I go to a movie and somebody sacrifices and does the right thing, you know, I cry my eyes out. It's just like, and then since I was a little boy, there's something inside me that just says, that's the goodness of the human yeah. spirit, you know? Yeah. And so my friends are people that are made up of that basically. And I have friends that are incredibly successful with the best in the world they do. I have a lot of friends that are 18 years my senior, 20 years my senior, and I've known them since they were, you know, 45, and now they're 75 or 80. And so they've given me kind of see the road ahead. Everybody's path is different, but the road of life changes. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in a stage of my life now where I'm, um, I'm able to mentor people at a different level, mm -hmm. you know, just because I've had so many life experiences that I've had to take into history. You know, I've, I've been there with Gorbachev at the point when he's trying to figure out what to do or Princess Diana when she's deciding does she want to no longer be a princess, you know. I've, I've had some wild experiences, the greatest athletes in the world at key moments in their careers. So I've had these cool tickets to history which have put things in such a perspective that when stuff happens that upsets people, it's like, you know, compared to what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like, you yeah. know, it's, uh, it's pretty simple compared to what most people happen to go through. So I felt really blessed. But I hope people, in the book, one of the things I hope people pick up that, you know, young people don't think about very much is testing. Mm -hmm. I was never a person that wanted, like, kind of like you with your wife, right? Ah, I'm going to do this thing. And then in order to perform, I learned every biohack. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't want to get in the system to get measured. But today, there's some amazing tests. So like I was, used to be afraid of cancer. There's a brand new test. The one thing in common in the book I should mention is, mm -hmm. I tell you all these stories of these amazing human beings that have created yes. these breakthroughs. And what they all have in common, they, these huge breakthroughs, some of which took 20 or 30 years and are just now available. They all lost somebody. They lost a wife or a husband or a child or a close patient. And it drove them not to accept the standard of care and find a new solution. And so one of those is this test called GRAIL. It's a simple blood test that anybody can do now. It just came out nine months ago, eight months ago. And it allows you to test your body for any cancer in your body. And so why is that important? Because the National Cancer Institute did a study and they found that if you get diagnosed at stage two, stage three or four, you have an 80% chance of dying. I prefer I have a 20% chance of living and figuring that out. But their point is well made, it's hard to turn around. If you get it at stage one or two, you have an 80 to 99.9% .9 chance of living. So we're, with cancer, is gonna affect most people in their lifetime. To be able to do a quick blood test and or an MRI for those pieces and know exactly what's going in your body is amazing. We had a doc, or a, a, a gentleman came to one of our centers and um, he had already had his physical and his wife said, I want you to have the very best. And he's like, oh, I've already done it. He had a really negative attitude about it, which we understood. And one of the docs said, listen, let's do the grail test on you. He'd already had urinalysis, blood tests, traditional and physical. And the guy ended up having bladder cancer. And, but it was really early he stage. Quite early, right, right, right. So it was a 20 minute outpatient procedure. He has no cancer. If he wouldn't have caught it, you got a real problem. Another one is, uh, it's called a CCTA scan. It's brand new. It's uh, one of my doctor friends, one of my partners in one of my businesses called me up and he says, Tony, and he's like Mr. Understated. He built 12 hospitals and then he sold them because he wants to be in prevention and regeneration. And he says, Tony, there's been one of the greatest breakthroughs in cardiology that I've seen in the last 10 years. You gotta come check it out. What is it? He goes, when a doctor does a CT scan, usually you don't get that unless you got a problem. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot, it's hard to read those scans. They're very gray, if you're very, skill is still missing. But there's this new scan now that uses AI and it literally opens every artery in your body because what they're looking for is soft plaques. Mm. Soft plaques can break off and it's called the Widowmaker. You have a heart attack or a stroke. If you're, and it happens to people now 35, 40 years old. It's, it's happening younger and younger because of the lifestyles that we've taken on. But what's interesting is hardened calcium, which is what they see when they do just a traditional scan, is healed. So I heard about it, so I'm going to go to the scan. And I took my father-in-law with me because he's 80 years old. And, you know, people around you when you get older start saying you should organize your affairs. And I could just see his energy drop. He's a great guy. Anyway, I took him to the scan. He's perfect. He's absolutely <laughs> perfect. And his entire attitude changed. Plus, you know, we have the stuff we do for a lot of the great athletes think their career's over where they scan yeah. an area where you've had an injury and they use ultrasound. And then they use this fluid, amnio fluid, and they open up the channel so that a nerve that's been trapped or some area heals. It heals in minutes. And so my, my father-in-law has also had this hip problem. It, it healed his hip problem in 30 minutes. His heart's perfect. We get on the air, airplane on the way home and he looks at me and goes, you know, Tony, these people talk about living 110, 120. I don't know about that, but I could live another 20 years. <laughs> I got a great heart. That's I got amazing. this great body. And that's he's like, amazing. and I'm walking perfectly. He goes, you've only been married my daughter 22 years. That's like another lifetime, you know? <laughs> and so what I love is what it does for people. And then, um, and then, uh, same thing with hormones. You know, when somewhere between 35 and 40, sometimes early 40s, hormones start to change radically. Women are more attuned to hormones, but they've learned the hormone replacement therapy. But like I had a guy that came, he was 39 years old, gained like, I don't know, I think it was like 35, 38 pounds or something like that. Really working out hard, making no progress, lost a sense of drive. And we said, well, have you looked at your hormones? He goes, yeah, my doc looked at my hormones, my hormones are fine. Well, we look at the blood test and his hormones, I think were, his testosterone was like 160. Mm -hmm. Most men don't feel alive unless they have seven to 800, some as much as a thousand. So he doesn't need replacement technically to be alive, but to have his body functioning at ideal was missing. So all he did was small amount of testosterone total transformation, loses weight, got his drive, got his libido back, got everything else back. Mm -hmm. So there's some little things you can do. There's metal tests. I had yes, a metal. really bad, uh, a bad hit with mercury because I was a vegan. Mm -hmm. Then I felt like I needed some other form of protein, so I started eating fish. And all I had was salmon and fish, salmon and fish. But I had tuna and swordfish are my favorites. Those are 75-year-old fish that eat all the smaller fish, and we polluted the water so much now, they're filled with mercury. And so I went to go get this set of tests and they tested me and on a zero to five, where five is extremely concerning, I was 123. And so I spent the last four or five years getting that mercury out of my body. It literally was make, it interrupts your ATP, your energy level. Like if you start feeling foggy or exhausted or tired, it can be metals. Yeah. And about one out of every three people, including friends that are 25 years old because of the environment we're in right now, they go and they discover they've got cadmium or they've got lead or they've got mercury. So I really encourage people to go do that metals test. If you're not feeling great, a lot of times when people think it's aging, yes. it's just metals. Yes. And you can get them out of your system when they're small, and it's a hell of a lot easier than what I've gone through yeah, in my life. And it's always, it's really interesting because you keep pushing, you can get lost in the fact that it's all in your head. Yeah. And you, the truth is it isn't always no, all in no, your it head. No, it isn't. Sometimes it's, it's physiological here. as well. Yeah, yeah, I had that recently where I was actually feeling fine, but I went and did, I went and did a lot of micronutrient tests, I did a lot yeah, of other tests. Yeah. I want to go and do a lot of the tests you just recommended. Yeah. I, I'm going to definitely ask you where I should go. But I went and did a basic vitamin D test. Right? Yes. I've been doing this since I was a kid. Yeah. And I went and my doctor and my, and my health coach was looking at the stats and everything. And she said to me, she said, Jay, you're at 10. Wow. The average is 60 and 100 is good. That's she, right. goes, she goes, I don't know how you get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And, and I was that like, affects your hormones, by the way. Correct. D3 affects your hormones. Yeah. And I was like, I get out of bed just fine. Yeah. And, and she couldn't believe that I was. You can overcome a lot with your psychology. Correct. Right? I was doing the same thing with mercury in my body. Correct. But I was thinking, imagine if my body was exactly. there too. Like, just imagine what would be possible. Yeah. And I think that's why I love what you've done with this book, Life Force, because that's what it's placing emphasis on. Yeah. It's like, go get tested. Go check it out. I love how you use the language of coaches, not commanders. Yes. Right? Like, we're not trying to, you're not saying to anyone, this is exactly what to do and this is how to do it. You're saying, please go and experiment with these things. Please that's go right. and practice them, implement them into your life. That's right. And I cannot wait to figure out how to implement all these things in my life because I think 
it's so easy to sit back when you're in your 20s, in your 30s, yes. and just go, oh, I'm okay right now, things are okay, I can eat, I can pretty much get away with a bad night out or a well, you, know, you know what I also wrote this book for, yeah. even the subtitle says it, it's for you and somebody you love. Yes, I love that, yeah. you're at, at the stage of life you're in, you're gonna start finding more people, whether it be your parents or someone else, yes. this is a challenge, and so there's, like whether it's, like for me at this stage of my life, I know yeah. so many people that, I don't know, two times a month at least, Someone calls me and they have a family member with cancer or somebody's starting to develop Alzheimer's or somebody had a stroke. And I didn't know what the hell to do before, right? Because the standard of care is so weak in those areas. But here you've got answers that'll blow your mind. Or you know somebody with Parkinson's, for example, like a grandma or somebody like that. I, I, there's this new technique, it's unbelievable. Use ultrasound. It's called incisionless brain surgery. They don't cut you open anyway. I saw this woman who's on 15 medications. I don't know if you've seen somebody with Parkinson's, but yes, they can't, yes, they can't yes. even hold a glass. They can't, yeah. She couldn't walk across the room. And they, it's an outpatient process. It's in 100 universities and, and it's covered by insurance now. This is how, how unbelievable this is and most people don't know about it. You go in, it takes about an hour to find the pinpoint spot that's creating the tremor. They treat it for 30 seconds. The woman comes out of the MRI, right? And she gets up, walks across the room, and I'm watching her. And then somebody hands her a glass, and it doesn't hit her. Like at first, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody gets those audio implants and they hear for the first yes, time, they yes, cry. Yes. But when they hand her the glass, and she can hold the glass, and she just starts crying uncontrollably. That was two years ago. Um, two months ago, she did a 50 mile bike ride, right? I mean, it's, it, that's the kind of tools that are available. Wow. If you've got osteoarthritis, someone's got osteoarthritis, and even kids 35, 40 years old, they're athletes, can create some real challenges in their body there. There's a new injection. This is not approved yet. It's a phase three trial. So phase one is safety, and then phase two is efficacy, and then phase three is efficacy at scale, then you get approved. So it's in the final stage. They think it'll be approved either in the fall or spring of next year. One injection, you've got osteoarthritis. It causes your own stem cells to regrow all your tendons based on the original DNA input. So it's like 16-year-old tendons, even if you're 30, 40, 50, or 60 years old, and no more osteoarthritis, brand new tendons inside your body. So this is the kind of world we're in right now. These are things that are happening right now that people just don't know about. And, so why, do, and why don't we know about them? And why, why is it that you right. have to go and dig all, because it seems like what you've done is you've mined, I've you and the, the team have gone and mined and gone to the very best to bring this to the fore. Like all my billionaire friends, they all know this because they all yes. want the cutting edge, right? So yes. all I did is kind of took what I did with Money Master the Game. That's yes. how I got introduced to some of this. And then I, and also it was my own needs. I tore my rotator cuffs yes. so yes. severely. Yeah. I was in a, following a 22-year-old professional snowboarder down the hill, <laughs> and I'm not a professional snowboarder. I could not make those moves. And literally, when I woke up, I was unconscious. I thought I broke my neck. I ripped my rotator cuffs. So what do you do? I go to four different doctors. They all say, surgery, surgery. Well, what's the prognosis? Well, you may not lift your arm above your shoulder again. It could tear again. How long to repair? How long did rehab? Four to six months. I'm going to be on stage doing this with one arm over here. So I, I work with a lot of the greatest of all time athletes and uh, Cristiano Ronaldo was supposed to be out for three months. He did stem cells, it took him two and a half weeks. Wow. So I was like, what about stem? No, no, they don't work, they don't work. And then it's like, I, I, I had the final doc literally look me in the face and he, he was a fan of my work. I didn't know going there. And he's like, oh my God, you're the Tony Robbins. He goes on and on, you saved my marriage. You made me all this money, da, da, da. And he goes, thanks for hearing that, but now I gotta be your doctor. And he puts my spine up and he goes, life as you know it is over. Literally what he said to me. I said, well, you clearly didn't go to my communication seminar. <laughs> and, he's, and he's like, this is not funny. Don't make a joke. This is real. And he goes, you know, you have severe spinal stenosis. I've been paying for 14 years. And he goes, one good hit and you're quadriplegic. No more jumping, no more running, no more life. And like, if you're hitting the stomach and you're ready for it, I wasn't ready for it. I gotta be honest, it was two hours of my feeling like my life was over. And then I got my head back. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna check out stem cells. And I met Bob Harari, one of the top guys in the world. He told me where to go in the United States, the ones I needed, you know, for your elbow, your knee, your own stem cells might work. But if you're doing a shoulder and a back or something, you need something more powerful. And he said, you need four day old stem cells. I go, I said, I don't want, you know, something that comes from baby. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, when babies are born, the cord is filled with this and the placenta is filled with these. And so I went and did four days of treatment, just an hour a day of an IV and a shot. First day I felt, you know, sleepy. Second day, I had a cytokine response. I wasn't scared. I knew what it was. Kind of shaking, freezing for 20 minutes. But then I woke up the next morning, and not only was my shoulder perfect, you have an MRI on my shoulder, you wouldn't even believe it. No downtime, no surgery, but my spinal stenosis is gone. I got no pain in my spine, and I've had that for 14 years. 
So it's like, that made me, that's why I wrote this book. I became obsessed. Then the Pope invited me to come speak. He, the Pope puts on the biggest regenerative conference every two years, and they wanted me to be the cleanup speaker. I'm like, I'll do that, <laughs> but I want to go through all four days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I met all these people who were sent home to die with cancer, who've been turned around, you know, stage four cancer, because they, some of the techniques in this book. I met uh, uh, Jack Nicholas, the greatest golfer of all time. He couldn't stand for more than 10 minutes. The pain was so bad. And now he's, he did, was supposed to have a spinal fusion, which he did not do, thank God. And he did stem cells, and now he's 82, playing golf and tennis again. So I was like, I became an evangelist. And then I just, I went and said, I want to learn the best of everything. And I learned it was much more than stem cells. It's yeah. this, just like you see technology doubling in power every 18 months and having a cost, we are code now. Mm -hmm. So most people have heard of CRISPR. I mean, yes, we're literally yes. curing diseases that would never have been cured in history before. And we're at the beginning of the beginning of that growth curve. So it's only up from here and the opportunities are extraordinary, but you can think of yourself, but you also think of people you love who might yeah. need your help and now you'll have answers. Definitely, I'm so grateful to you, Peter and Robert for putting this book together because yeah. I, like I said, I just dived into it and into each chapter and it's just so comprehensive, it's so dense. It's got every study and research that yeah. you need to convince you that it's out there. Yeah. And now, and I love what you just added to what I was saying that we need to go use it for the people we love. If it's yeah. not for us, let's go use it for them. Yeah. And then one day, because you helped everybody else, they'll be there for you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Tony, you have uh, been so generous with your time. Thank you. I've enjoyed You've it with been you very so much, Jay. so generous with your energy. Thank you. Uh, and of course, in doing all the work and putting this book together, you can tell that I'm, I'm writing my second book right now. And I can tell that when you see a book that is this well researched <laughs> and this deeply done, uh, you know that a lot of work has gone into that. So I want to recommend, we're going to put this in the link, in the caption, in the comment section, everywhere the link to this book. Uh, I know that it's already been an incredible in international best-selling book all over the world. Uh, so if you haven't already got it, I highly recommend you go and get it. Get it for a friend too, get it for a family member. Get it to give it to someone as well if you know that they need this right now. And of course, get it for yourself. And we're donating, uh, I'm donating 100% of the, the, the profits from this book because I've done all three of my books, last three books, to Feeding America. So we're feeding 20 million meals there. And so, besides helping yourself, you're helping other people. And then the balance is going for uh, Alzheimer's, cancer, and heart disease yeah. research from three of the best researchers in the world. So hopefully, the book not only changes your life, but it will also help other people too. Yeah, that's phenomenal. So you're contributing as well as reading, of it, yeah, yeah, which is absolutely beautiful. No, I'm saying, I'm saying the audience gets to contribute oh, yes, through yes, you simply yes. by even buying the book. So yeah, even true. buying the book is contributing. That's true. Tony, we end every On Purpose interview with the final five. Uh, these are five questions that are aimed at usually one word to one sentence answers. Okay. But with Super you, capable of that. Yeah, with you, I don't, I don't even want to do it with you. I'm like, I'm like, I don't want to do that with you. I want to break the rules. I'm like, why am I going to restrict your greatness to that? Anyway, so here we go. These are your final five. We can okay. totally go off piece. I do not Should care. Go for it. I don't care at all. All right. Question number one is, what is the best advice you've ever received? I think um, for me, my original teacher was Jim Rohn, who I met him when I was 17. And I wanted to know why all my fathers were broke, because they were good men. Mm. You know, I loved all four of my fathers. And, um, and I remember him saying, Tony, we're all equal as souls, but we're not equal in the marketplace. Mm. I was like, what does that mean? And he said, well, think about it. He goes, you need to become more valuable if you want to have economic freedom he said, you have to work on yourself more than anything else, and you have to work on it in a way where there's something you can do for others better than anyone else, mm -hmm. or at least more, a better quality. And he gave me an example of like working at McDonald's, and he said, you know, if you work at McDonald's, you know, you make whatever it was in those days, $5 an hour, whatever it was. And he said, you know, I go, yeah, but that seems so unfair. And he goes, yeah, and teachers, I gave the example of teachers, and there's these billionaires, you know, that make a billion dollars a year, hedge fund guy, you know? And he said, Tony, the guy you just mentioned, he provided a 40% return last year, and that went to nonprofits and everything else. He said, that means those organizations double their money almost every two years. He is adding massive value, hundreds of billion dollars, so he made a billion. He goes, this person is doing a job that anyone can learn in 20 minutes or half a day, so it's a beginning job. He said, you've got, you got to think of it as one thing. It's all about adding value. How can you do more for others than anybody else in the world? And that stuck with me. I mean, I was just like, I, I decided I wanted to do more for this than anybody in the world. In order to do that, I had to have certain skills and I went after those skills and I still do. Like yeah. it's a never ending thing. If you think yeah. you're a master, you're full of it, right? Yeah. So I think that's probably some of the best advice I've received, at least on life and business and direction and, and it affected my mission. Yeah, that's great. Uh, second question, what's the 
worst piece of advice you've ever heard. <laughs> worst piece of advice. <laughs> you've ever heard, not received, maybe received, but. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I've had lots of pieces of advice about what to do with my body, which would have, you know, like, like the, the really sweet man, like sincere man. Yes, yeah. and, and I realized that people can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Yeah. Um, but like, if I would have taken that drug, you know, I probably would have had cancer. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I try not to listen to or forget. I mean, the <laughs> yeah. advice isn't too good. I think anybody who, who advises you to give up is the wrong. That's, yeah, that's probably yeah. the worst advice of all because anything that you persist in long enough, you can find the answer to, I believe. Yeah. And based on that, also, the first piece of advice you get on your health yes, is, yes. is not always the right piece this of advice. A, I'm glad you mentioned this. Yeah. The Mayo Clinic did a study in 2017. They took 286 patients with various diagnoses. And they took the first diagnosis and then they had a, a second doctor do a, a diagnosis. Only 12% of the time did they match. That means 88% of the time, the first diagnosis and the second look different. As a result, the Mayo Clinic says you should always get a second opinion and they believe getting a second, even a third one, refines the diagnosis and makes it better because everyone's working through their perceptions. It's not, we think of, of medicine as like black and white, you know, it's right or it's wrong. Mm. And it's, it's, it's a lot of art in, in medicine. Mm. And people don't realize that. Mm. And that's why a standard of care doesn't always get the result they want. That's why these breakthrough doctors, beyond the standard of care, they were attacked some of them in the beginning. Like there's a man named Dr. June in there who created these CAR T cells. And I think it's Nature just did a publication. 10 years later, they're still, you know, in cancer, they never call it a cure. Actually, calling it a cure for the first time for liquid, you know, like like leukemia and things like liquid cancers, and it's like it's amazing. So you you've got to understand that there's more than one opinion, and you don't give up too easily with just one. Yeah, and that applies to life too, in so many ways, like you said. Yeah. I always say it's like if it's if it's about your health, if it's about your relationship, if it's about raising your children, if it's about your spiritual development, those are areas where people should be your coach, not your commander. Yes. Get lots of input, and you decide because. They could be sincerely, sincerely wrong. If you're wrong, at least you learn from your own experience. Absolutely. Question number three. Uh, what's something you think the majority of people value, but you don't value? Fame. But you know, it's easy when you have something. Then it's like easy to go, oh, everybody yeah. wants it. You don't know, but it's like when you experience when, it. When did that happen? Did, was there ever a time you valued fame? Or, or was it the experience of it that made you devalue it a little? I wouldn't say a devalue. Yeah. I, I still appreciate it. It's, it's a privilege. Like I get, you know, I can walk in the room and have people that I have a connection with, you know, but it's been more based on my contribution to them than just being famous per se. Yes, yeah, okay, go ahead. I mean, that's the yes. difference. You know, like yes. a lot of my friends you know, in the movie business, like somebody comes up and they get upset because they go, they don't even know who I am, they just want something from me. And mine is, it's a privilege if, if somebody can be lit up by your presence, to me it's a privilege. Yeah, so, absolutely. but I think, I think, I never, I was never pursuing fame. Yes, yes. Um, I, you know, I certainly wanted financial freedom because I grew up without it for my family, mm -hmm. but I never, uh, I was never looking to be wealthy. Um, but I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of economic freedom at this stage. So, but I know that there are people that have got billions of dollars. I've worked with them, and they're miserable. I've got people that have billion dollars, and they take their own life. Yeah. You know, it, what matters is where's your emotional home. Mm -hmm. you now, where do you live emotionally? If you're worth a billion dollars, and every day you're pissed off and frustrated, your life is pissed off and frustrated. If you got three beautiful children, or a beautiful husband and wife, and all this love in your life, but you're worried all the time. You don't feel the love, you're worried. So I, my, my thing is valuing the emotional home and making it the richest place possible inside. Yeah. Because that's the only thing you can control. Yeah, you reminded me, I was, I was with one of my clients who gets recognized a hundred times for every one time I would get recognized. Yeah. And he'd get stopped every two seconds if someone yeah. take a picture, maybe someone come shake my hand and talk yeah. to me. And we spent a whole day together and this would happen multiple times a day for him yeah. and a few times for me. And he said something really beautiful with me that, that mirrors what you just said now. He said to me, he said, Jay, the difference between me getting stopped and you getting stopped is they stop me for who I play in the movies right. because they stop you for who you are. That's right. And, and that's what I feel with you. Yeah. It's like what you were saying there. It's like that is a privilege and an honor. A total privilege. And humbles me because it's the idea of, yeah, like that person, he's like, they don't even know who I am. They don't yeah. know what I stand for. They don't know what I care about. Yeah. So yeah. that was, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. All right. Question number four is if you could create one law that everyone in the world had to follow, what would it be? Love. <laughs> I mean, I mean, love as corny as it is, love yeah. is the answer, right? It really yeah. is. I think uh, fear is what, you know, if there's a disease of humanity, the disease that messes us up, I think really is selfishness. Yeah. And I think if there's a cure, it's love. Yeah. And I think um, you can't mandate it, but when people <laughs> experience it, it becomes a mandate in their life, you know? I love that. Absolutely. And fifth and final question, you mentioned a book to me that I must read. 
and you said you wanted to talk about it in the podcast too. So fifth yes. and final question, I thought maybe I'd let you share on that point. Yes. If you wanted oh, yes. to talk about cycles. That we That's a book I read, and I think it came out in the early 90s. It's called The Fourth Turning. And it's, it has a, the conceit of the book is that there are seasons in history. And as I mentioned to you earlier, if you think about like what gives somebody power in any context, it's three things. It's pattern recognition. So if I'm great at running businesses as I am today, pretty good at it. It's like, I, I recognize there's only so many patterns. I know what to do. I can anticipate, not react. I can grow it. If you're great in, uh, let's say the stock market, you know to recognize patterns. If you're great with music, you recognize patterns. If you're great spiritually, you recognize patterns. But the second skill is you don't just recognize them, you can use them. And then the third skill is when you recognize and use enough patterns, you start to create them. Mm -hmm. And that's a different dimension of what's going on. So in this book, you really start to see that humanity changed when we recognize the pattern of the seasons. Mm -hmm. As soon as we understood seasons, we didn't have to be wandering through the desert anymore, searching for things. We could stay, we could grow crops, because we found out if you plant in the winter, <laughs> it doesn't matter how hard you work, yeah. nothing happens. But when you know the right time to plant, when you know how to do the right thing at the right time, then all of a sudden humanity grew into communities and cities and states and everything else. Well, we have also seasons of our life. So, you know, in, in you know, some of the traditional, let's say, Indian philosophy, as I'm sure you know, there, we can look at these four stages, but we can look at it and say, well, the first 20 years of your life, roughly, you're primarily learning and taking things in. Some of us had to work at five years old and so forth, but overall, that's how it is. From 20 to 40, that, you know, that's springtime. Summer, you're figuring out who you are. Okay, they told me all this crap, nobody tested it. Do I really believe that? Does it really work? I now have real relationships. I think I'm invincible. Maybe I'm not, I'm gonna discover. 20 to 40 is this massive growth period in your life. And if you grow during that time, 40 to 60 is really a reaping time, right? It's like the fall and the autumn and things come together and things go great. And then from 60 to 80 and maybe 80 on, if you have an extended winter, that's the winter time where now you get to be kind of an elder. So everyone is going to hit winter if they live long enough. Meaning some people experience winter in that zero to 20 stage. Mm -hmm. Some people 20 to 40. Mm -hmm. When you experience it shapes your life a lot. So in America, the generation we call the greatest generation is the generation of World War II. And they were not respected as young people. I bring this up because millennials, you know, older people very often look at millennials and go, oh, they're snowflakes, they can't handle anything. And some are, in every generation there are people like that. But the generation was born, let's say, in 1910. That generation, if you think about it, they came of age going to that 20-year-old range. What happened in those 20 years? Well, World War I ended and America was one of the winners. And then there was the roaring 20s and new technology and cars and parties and all this abundance. It was everywhere. So they grew up thinking that's what their life was going to be like. And at 19 years old, they were born in 1910, it was 1929. And the whole world, around the world, People jumping out of buildings, the dust bowl in the middle of the place, the jobs lost. I mean, it was intense. And they were called flappers. They were not respected. <laughs> they were just partiers. They didn't give a damn about anything. They had no responsibility. And suddenly life hit them and they grew. They had to. And they went through 10 years of that depression only to make it to 29 years old when it's now 1939 and World War II breaks out and you and I weren't alive then, but anybody alive then will tell you Hitler was winning. Countries were dropping in your country and London was being bombed. I mean, it did not look like we were going to win. It was dark, right? And they made it through that, went over, fought the war and won. So they had this stage of their life from 20 to 40, which was a horrendous experience but it made them so strong and they came back heroes and they started the next springtime because that was winter, right? Mm -hmm. So the next springtime was late 40s after World War II through the 1950s, early 60s until Kennedy was shot. That kind of 18, 20 year period was a period of great prosperity and growth and everything's easy. And then you have a summer which is always internal conflict. And you can see this in a thousand years of Roman history. Every 80 to 100 years, you've seen the same patterns. And then after that, you have another fall where finances flow, stock markets rise, everything blows again. This happens over and over and over again through history. So when you see it, it gives you perspective. And so we're in winter right now. We've been in winter since about 2008, and we're not done. We probably got another six, if history shows, the, you know, the, if, if it's repetitive, it's not exact. Yeah. There's probably another seven or eight years of this. And what happens in winter is the external world gets, the last winter was World War II and the external world is reformed 
Different countries relate in a different way. You know, a new reserve currency happened. The United States became the dominant force. Now you're dealing with China. We're seeing the challenges happening in Russia and the Ukraine. We're seeing things all over the world. People are looking at life differently. People are worried about whether the planet's going to survive or not, global warming. And so there's going to be a lot more turmoil. There's internal turmoil within most countries, including the United States. But what I try to tell people that hopefully helps them is winter does not last forever. No pandemic has lasted forever. No war has lasted forever. And what's next is springtime. If you were God, wouldn't you work it out that way? After the vicious night, you have this beautiful day. After the tough winter, there's this nice springtime. So the goal right now is to get strong in winter, not to fold. To, if you can be strong in this season, in your business, in your life, then when springtime comes, it's a piece of cake. And if you do well in business during this time, if you look at the Fortune 1000, 65% of them were born in a winter, in a depression or a recession. Whether it's Exxon or it's Disney and depressions, or whether it's Pizza Hut or Federal Express that was done in a recession, or Apple or Microsoft in a recession. So if you do well then, you tend to do well through time. And so this is a time, to, you know, not to say, oh, it's winter, I'm going to freeze to death. It's like, no, it's a time to learn, grow, expand, spend time with your family, snowboard, you know, take advantage of the season and don't think the season is forever. And if you, if you read a book like this, it, it's a book that, like, some of the greatest leaders I know have all read this book. I got, they also wrote a book called Generations. It's about 550 pages of Anglo-American history. And it shows how each generation affects it. So what you start seeing is there's patterns here. There's patterns in history. This isn't forever. How do I use what's in front of me instead of freaking out and saying, oh my God, the whole world's coming to an end? Because it looks like that when the dark night of the winter happens or the dark night of the soul.